Welcome to Civility and American Democracy, a national forum. Presented by the Center for Civil Discourse at the McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. In partnership with Mass Humanities, WBUR Radio, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Moderating today's discussion, the host of WBUR's On Point, Tom Ashbrook. Thank you. And we are back on the civil discourse train. We've talked today about civility or civil discourse and American history. That is some history and it's not all that civil. We've talked about civility, civil discourse and morality, how to get there. Uh, civility not as a substitute for morality, maybe as a way to it, maybe if it's uh, too precious, as, a, as an obstacle to it. We're going to begin this session looking at civility and culture. We are a country of many cultures. What about civility in that environment? Our calls for civility, a distraction that marginalizes the individual and inhibits an honest evaluation of absolutes? Does the practice of civility evolve differently in different cultural experiences? And what happens to civil discourse when it is expressed through many cultures within one great political culture here in the United States, in our American democracy? We have a great panel for the conversation this afternoon. Diana Eck is with us, professor of comparative religion and Indian studies at Harvard University. Great to have you here. Thank you. Mark Lilla is with us, professor of the humanities at Columbia University. Wonderful to have you as well. And the great Ilan Stavans, professor of Latin American and Latino culture, Amherst College. Wonderful to have you Thank here. You. Thank you so much. Once again, we will hear from each of our three presenters. We'll have a little exchange and then exchange among ourselves and then invite the entire audience here in the hall and around the country to join us. So have the wheels in your mind turning as we settle down for a few minutes here to hear from Diana Eck. Diana, thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> thank you so very much. I think we've got a slide going up there, but the research of the Pluralism Project over the past 20 years at Harvard has documented the changing religious landscape of the United States with Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs and others. And of course, change is a source of anxiety and to some extent, a source of incivility. Among the landscapes that we have documented is the changing Islamic landscape from a former movie theater in Chicago, gradually visible mosques at 96th and 3rd in New York, in Cleveland, in the cornfields outside Toledo, here in Boston at Roxbury Crossing. And civility does have a landscape, a landscape that sometimes is alarming to many people. Some of these, like the Orland Park Prayer Center outside Chicago, have their, had their share of controversy as city councils and planning commissions and zoning boards have wrestled with issues of zoning and traffic and noise on Fridays and the multitude of anxieties that come in local context with change. But then, in the past few years, it wasn't about zoning or traffic. It was naked opposition to having a mosque at all. The gloves were off. Well, civility, it kind of depends on whom you ask. Stop Islam became the sign, not a very civil sign, not even a very constitutional sign. Of course, 9-11 raised concern about extremists and terrorists and, uh, and Muslims who may be out to kill us, but wait. All I needed to know about Islam I learned on 9-11 how did we get from extremists and terrorists to speaking categorically about Muslims? What is it that permits that rhetorical slippage from Muslim terrorists to language that deliberately impugns and denigrates Muslims in general? Blacks, Catholics, Jews, gays. During the fall of 2008, this rhetorical slippage was utilized in a national advertising campaign the massive distribution of 28 million copies of the DVD called Obsession, Radical Islam's War Against the West, a paid advertisement uh, paid for by the Clarion Fund. In more than 70 newspapers, 28 million copies distributed especially in swing states, 
in the 2008 election. The film moves seamlessly through a barrage of violent images pieced together with the voices of commentators from speaking of radical Islam to impugning Muslims and Islam generally, with fear-mongering parallels between Muslim terrorists and Nazis. Why, we may ask? Well, it may have had something to do with the election of Barack Obama, indeed, a president who then hosted iftar dinners at the White House and hoped to improve relations with the Muslim world, including that part of the Muslim world that is right here in America. By the midterm elections in the summer of 2010, the simple message, stop Islam, had been amplified to Islam kills and whatever else is meant by the phrase Barak Akbar. Remember that summer of 2010, a nationwide, ultimately worldwide controversy over the proposed creation of a Muslim community center in Lower Manhattan. Imam Faisal Rauf had been long leading a community center in Lower Manhattan. He had long been active in interfaith affairs. He had a dream, an interfaith center called Cordoba House that would be named for that particular period in Islamic history when Spain, when Jews, Christians, and Muslims lived together in what was called convivencia. Uh, Civic-minded, certainly, Imam Faisal Rauf was in general. He met a developer who had been looking for a good place to establish a Muslim community center. He found a building two blocks north of Ground Zero, Lower Manhattan, the fastest growing area of the city. But Gamal noticed, Sharif al-Gamal, we don't have a community center at all in Lower Manhattan. At the end of the day, I'm a New Yorker. There are Jewish community centers all over the city. I see a Muslim community center as a way of giving back to the people. And then Daisy Khan, Faisal Ralph's wife, she was in on it too. She worked on establishing women's initiatives aimed at empowering women to play greater roles in their societies worldwide. Both of their life's work, Imam Faisal and Daisy had been dedicated to fostering better relations between Islam and the West. The community board of Lower Manhattan approved the uh, initiative completely, 15 of them, in uh, May 19, uh, uh, 2010. And a positive move, they said, that would bring jobs, vitality, cultural event, recreation, community, to an area near the World Trade Center that was in need of rebuilding. So imagine their astonishment when the next morning in New York Daily News, it was reported that a 13-story mosque was to be built steps from ground zero. But there it was in the headlines, a 13-story mosque. That was not it at all. Before long, the energies of the blogosphere operating at full force dubbed this the Monster Mosque, the Victory Mosque, the World Trade Center Mosque, the Ground Zero Mosque. It grew legs. It was everywhere. Much of the labeling and media heat on the topic could be attributed to conservative blogger Pamela Geller, who along with Robert Spencer of Jihad Watch had launched an effort called Stop the Islamization of America. What could be more insulting, she said, humiliating than a monster mosque in the shadow of the World Trade Center? Stop the Islamization of America. But was this what they were about? Faisal Ralph, Daisy Khan, the Islamization of America? But the hate began, a barrage of media attacks, the struggle to maintain a civil response to a twisted campaign of misinformation. Of course, for some 9-11 families, the controversy was about citing the project. Never mind if it wasn't to be a mosque. Real is emotions were part of this, too. However, it became clear that the forces fueling this controversy were not really about citing this particular mosque at all. The same forces were there on the streets, in the council meetings, in the press, for every mosque on Staten Island, in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn, in Tennessee, in Wisconsin, in California. Why here, Geller asked at Sheepshead Bay. And Robert Spencer put it, these people are subversives working from within the system to destroy us. It's not going to happen in Sheepshead Bay or anywhere. Stop the 9-11 mosque was stop the Islamization of America. Stop any mosque. The signage of this civil maelstrom included another word, Sharia, 
Islamic law, the moral path, the path of Islam. But the signs were pretty ominous looking, scrawled in red as if dripping with blood. One began to see these signs from coast to coast, signaling somehow a barbarity of intention. Legislation was introduced in state ballot initiatives, legislatures, it continues to today, to prohibit the use of Islamic law in American courts. Legislation crafted largely on a template drawn by a legal scholar affiliated with Frank Gaffney's Center for Security Policy. But why? Why were these Tea Party protesters carrying this profusion of blood-dripping Sharia signs? Nothing but tagging this word as the graffiti of a nationwide Islamophobic campaign. Well, the other side of the discourse was, you might say, civic, civil, no red meat here, groundless hatred is the real enemy. Say no to hate, when you oppress one, you oppress all. We saw a nationwide campaign, not just in New York, but the gathering of forces in Murf Murfreesboro, Tennessee, for example. Noisy protests and rallies with both opponents and defenders of a new Islamic center to be built there. Never mind that the Muslim community had been in this part of Tennessee for decades, but when the white sign went up, the future site of the Islamic Center of Murfreesboro, the demonstrations began. People waving American flags, Israeli flags, some chanting USA or Jesus, Jesus. At first you might have thought that the USA chanters were really chanting about the right to freedom of conscience and practice and faith that is integral to what makes us USA. Or maybe those Jesus chanters were Christians who vociferously defended Jesus' gospel of love or the love of neighbor, but actually that was not so. They were the protesters, the no new mosque people. One resident told ABC News, I found out when the sign went up, we're fighting these people for crying out loud. We should not be promoting this. Our country was founded through the founding fathers, the true God, the Father and Jesus Christ. And again, yes, there were supporters, the coexist people, saying that freedom of religion means freedom for all religions. And another talking point emerged that Islam is not a religion. It's not just the mosque, they say. It's a political way of life that they're trying to force on us. It's not a religion, it's a political movement. The sign was vandalized to read, not the future site of the Islamic Center of Murfreesboro. And, across, and even the, uh, the bulldozer that was brought in to begin the construction was vandalized since that was all that was there. A, a pipe bomb was placed near it and it blew up one evening. Across the country in Temecula, California, again, a similar protest, similar signs, uh, a translocal issue, no Sharia law, no mosque in America, no mosque or Muslims in America, uh, an offering of roses by a hijabi woman, well, uh, no deal, according to these protesters. And then that uh, hostility had not to do only with institutions, but oddly enough, with civic-minded people, like Parvis Ahmed at the University of North Florida, a finance professor originally from Calcutta, nominated by the city council to be on the Jacksonville Human Rights Commission. Lived in Jacksonville for 36 years wrote extensively on Muslim roles in public affairs, had won public awards. It was not easy to call his credentials into question, but the local chapter of a group called Act for America did just that. And what was Act for America? Ahmed himself had to Google it when the onslaught of personal attacks began. Founded by a Lebanese Christian woman, Brigitte Gabrielle, who was determined not to let happen here in America what happened in her home country of Lebanon, what she saw as a radical Muslim takeover. They must be stopped, she said, and they meaning radical terrorist Muslims, well, maybe even Muslims like Parvez Ahmed. At the city council meeting, one speaker said, we're engaged in a war on terror, but that's not their only tactic. An additional tactic of our enemy is to infiltrate our organizations, our country, our councils, everywhere, to take a change and effect a change from within. So ACT had in a short time established chapters across the country. 
Eventually, I would say Parvez was uh, confirmed to the City uh, Human Rights Commission. But Act for America claimed, and that also gained legs, that it was not constitutional for Muslims to hold public office in America. He was only one of a number of individuals signal, sing, singled out for uh, particular attack by groups like Stop the Islamization of America. Uh, Debbie Almentasser, we remember, the public school teacher in New York, an Arabic dual language school that was soon dubbed a madrasa in Brooklyn. Dr. Farouk Khan, a professor at City University of New York. And finally, the way in which this is described by not only Peter King and others, but the way in which it's described by some of those who are involved in these groups, not as the jihad of those who are out to do violence to America, but perhaps even more toxically, the stealth jihad of those who are gaining credibility in the American mainstream, masking their real motives, who operate by deceit and stealth from inside the gate. America must wake up to the threat of these seemingly ordinary people who are involved civically in public affairs. And finally, I would just call your attention to a report written by the Center for American Progress last summer and published called Fear, Inc., looking at a small and tightly networked group of funders, of misinformation experts, of media partners, and of grassroots organizations like the ones I've mentioned that have as their business to essentially uh, promote fear as a corporate enterprise. It's, it's well uh, titled Fear, Inc., because it is very deliberate. So how do we deal with our civic uh, mindedness and our civility in the face of deliberate campaigns of misinformation and the promotion of fear in a population that is ripe for thinking uh, fearfully about new others uh, amongst us. Diana, thank you very uh, much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let me ask you. Thank you. So we understand this story in a context of prejudice, uh, opposition, phobia, fear, hatred. What is your invitation in this, in this description of a reality in our country? This is a meeting of cultures on that kind of field. What's the invitation here in the context of civil discourse? I think the invitation is that uh, our encounter with one another in uh, the United States is an encounter that will require much more openness and engagement and that, uh, that incivility thrives on the level of ignorance that we have of neighbors who are no longer simply neighbors on the other side of the world, but neighbors on the other side of the street. So the uh, challenge is really the challenge of engagement with difference in a society in which difference becomes the seedbed of fear. We'll work on that world of, of difference today and civility in that world. Diane thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. And next, Mark Lila. Mark, thank you. Well, at the end of my uh, remarks, I'll um, be talking a bit about some of the things that uh, Diane just spoke of. I'd only begin by remarking the difference between the tone of what we just heard and what we heard this morning, where there was a kind of, uh, if not idealization, uh, at least a very high tolerance for uncivil uh, political discourse. And um, we just saw what the face of that looks like right now. Um, but I'd like to begin with some of the things that were spoken about this morning and connect them up with uh, our theme here. And I'd like to test everyone's tolerance right now while I make the case against justice. We talk too much about it. It's a legacy of the policies and the politics uh, in, in the United States, in the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s when politics genuinely was about um, struggle, dissent, representation, marginalization, and the rest. But that is not the whole of politics. Um, but this view that essentially politics is about movement struggles and claims for rights, that is what, that's what political life 
is about ha has shaped our intellectual culture, and certainly in universities, the historical profession, absolutely, and even the way we conduct, our, some of us conduct ourselves politically. Uh, it's led to, and I, and I feel we heard a bit of this this morning, it, it's led to a kind of hyperbolic and homiletic style of speaking about American politics. That's what the history books that our children read today are like. They're homilies. They focus on uh, marginal groups. They focus on struggles for justice, which is part of our history. But they lack context. They lack the context of where that fits into the larger picture of what goes on in American political life. Simply put, justice isn't everything, nor should it be. Political life and even moral life, both those lives are far more complex to them to be reduced down to the pursuit of one thing. That the other claims of politics and morality are legitimate as well. And I feel that we need to put our conversation today in the context of politics as such, not this narrow view of one part of politics. Um, my daughter is just graduating from high school, and I'm, and I'm struck by how much her historical education has focused on these things. Less talk about, uh, let's say, the history of the American economy, American business, our relation to the environment, the development of technology, and especially foreign policy and the history of diplomacy and military history. Like Alan, I guess I react against uh, what I felt was this morning a kind of reductio ad Bull Connor uh, that sees that Bill Connor is a prism for understanding our condition and for thinking about the very important subject of civility. Uh, there's an apocalyptic style that we have a tendency to engage in as, as a country. Um, civility is crucial for the ordinary work of politics. And by ordinary, I do not mean to say they're at a lower level. But these things, too, are the stuff and substance of political life. To help make that clear, I'd like to distinguish something that's been implicit in a lot of the comments today between two kinds of civility. Let's call one social civility, and let's call the other political civility. In social life, the kind of civil society that uh, Alan was talking about earlier, toleration is a great virtue. It's also one of the great problems. And if you compare, for example, the way in which uh, Islam is being received in this country on the ground, not, not just in dramatic episodes like this, to the way it's being received in Europe, where there are important political parties devoted almost entirely and inspired by a rejection of uh, Islamic citizens in their own countries. So we have a struggle with toleration. It's important to talk about it, and that's been implicit today. Political civility, to my mind, is something else. The word civility actually derives from civitas, the Latin word for the political order. And what civility, in a political sense, means participating in political discussion and our political institutions in a knowledgeable way and in an engaged way. That's what it is to be civil in politics. It's not to be tolerant or intolerant. It's to engage in a certain way by taking the process seriously. Now, Europe today is having a problem with civility uh, at the political level, not just, not just the social level. And that has something to do with the fact that, um, that on the one hand, there's an attempt to create a European Union that makes the nation less important, but in ways people don't understand, because what's Europe? 
Even the currency doesn't have any pictures on it. No one knows what it represents. And on the other hand, there's been a very rapid uh, rise in immigration of people not only from many countries, but Muslim countries, but also from areas in Muslim countries where uh, rural areas where their habits and mores and uh, just education are just very, very different. It, it, it's a struggle for them. Um, so between that, there's a lack of civil commitment in Europe right now. And the lack of civility that you see is a kind of disengagement that you'll have nationalist parties as you do in Italy, as you do in the Netherlands, as you do in Belgium, that are essentially for pulling out. The Northern League in Italy would like the northwest of Italy simply to pull out. We don't want to have anything to do with the immigrants, nothing to do with Rome. Um, in the United States, we have a strong sense of the civic uh, and a strong sense of belonging. But whereas in Europe, those who are civically engaged are knowledgeable and respectful and knowledge is prized, just the reverse is the case in our politics today. I understand that American politics was, you know, always raucous and all the rest, um, but there has been a decline of respect for knowing, simply knowing things in our politics that to me represents a departure given the fact that government, the United States role in the world is much more complicated and requires much more knowledge to have a useful opinion or to be engaged seriously. Uh, that the United States is no longer the semi-backwater it was in the 19th century. Government is no longer a simple thing. It requires all sorts of experts. It requires scientists and accountants and economists and and uh, environmentalists, it requires all these sorts of people who have expertise. But there is something that has entered our civic discourse that has been not only indifferent to that, but hostile to it. An idealization of ignorance, a contempt for learning, for science, and for the so-called elites who, um, who master them. That, for me, and not some of the other things we've been talking about. That, to me, is the most serious and portentous breakdown in civility in our political lives today. Mark, oh. thank you. Thank you, Mark Lilla, thank you. Let me just ask you then, in that context, um, let's take the histrionics out of it. Let's move away from the hyperbolic style, if indeed, if, if that's how you see it. What is the end, then, of the civil discourse you'd prescribe? What's the end? Getting it right. Getting what right? Well, that's, that's what we talk about, right? That is, if we're going to have a foreign policy that has certain aims, how do we get there? If we're, as a country, have to talk about what our aims are, what do we bring to the table? And we not only bring to the table opinions, we bring knowledge to the table. And that should be the price of entry in the door. And you mean aims rather than ideals? Absolutely, instead of ideals. I'm tired of ideals as well. I'm talking about, in the short term, how do we defend and extend our national interests? How do we uh, help to sustain a world order in which na nations like ourselves can operate? Um, there's a way of thinking that you're shooting higher by talking about ideals in this matter in this matter, and you're shooting much lower. You set the bar too low. Shift from ideals to aims, and you have to bring information. That's or you have nothing point. to talk about. That's my point. That would be a culture shift. Mark Lilla, thank you very yes. much. <laughs> Elon Stavans, please. I don't want to shy away from the apocalypse. I believe that there's not enough talk about the apocalypse. And in fact, I believe that the apocalypse has already taken place. Um, I don't think that we can separate uh, discussions on civility from issues of immigration. This is a country defined from the very beginning as a country of immigrants. In 1950 is a year that divides the United States between one way of looking at immigration and another. It, prior to 1950, the majority 
of people who came from other parts of the world came mostly from Europe. Most of them came from a unified sense of what that region was. And I'm not including in this category African Americans because I'm not including, I'm not talking about slaves, I'm talking in this particular case about immigrants. After 1950, the majority of people who have been in this country, who have come from abroad, abroad are people that do not come from Europe. They come from Asia, they come from Africa, they come from Latin America. The apocalypse has taken place because this no longer is the same country that it was in 1950. This is a country that has many, many um, people of color, and it really shocks me the way we talk about civility in forums like this where the majority of people are of a particular background, uh, probably 55 and older, where there is no young people, and certainly there's no people of diverse color. I'm hoping that in Alaska, where people are listening to us, there will be a difference. Um, uh, there are 50 plus million Latinos in the United States. It is an astonishing number. There are more Latinos in the United States than Spaniards in Spain. There are more Latinos in the United States than Canadians in Canada. The number of Latinos in the United States is larger than in most countries of Latin America. There are more Latinos in the United States than in countries like Venezuela, or in countries certainly like El Salvador or Nicaragua. The difference between El Salvador and Nicaragua and Venezuela and Mexico and Argentina is that most Latinos that live in the United States are not from one particular country, but from a diverse country. The multiplicity that we have in many cities in this country is also the multiplicity that exists within the Latino population. Issues of civility have to be projected to understand how these different immigrant groups perceive civility. The majority of the immigrants that have come from Latin America have come escaping dictatorship, escaping political persecution, having a sense that our vote over there does not count. The transition to assimilation is a transition, to the transition to America is a transition that has to do with giving up certain visions of the past certain ways of political representation to engage in new ways. And the question that is, in, that is often asked is, is assimilation still taking place in America? Are we still the country that we were prior 1950 or at the end of the 19th century? Or when the founding fathers created with this beautiful idea what this country would eventually become? And the fact is, no. Latinos are not integrating the way other groups have integrated in the past. There are pockets in this country that are increasingly large where the spoken language is Spanish. Uh, where the spoken language, not only in the classroom, not only at home, but also on the street. There is an intense duality among us Latinos. Do we belong to Latin America or do we belong to the United States? The melting pot has disappeared. The mosaic has come up. And in this new mosaic, the idea of duality is an idea that really sits well among us. In order to change America, we have to change Latinos. But in order to change Latinos, we have to understand who Latinos are. And if we don't do something about it, we are not going to be able to recognize the country in which we live today. I am absolutely shocked uh, at the absence of reference that we have had so far this day to anything that has to do with Latino culture. We have had constant reminders of Martin Luther King and not one single reference to Cesar Chavez, probably the most important Latino in this country. It doesn't represent all Latinos, a very uh, uh, difficult and problematic Latino, but one that stood also for social disobedience, one that delivered uh, letters such as the letter from Birmingham, uh, from the Birmingham jail, and about which I want to believe that some people in the audience know something about, but I doubt it. I doubt it because the topic of Latino history is not a topic that is integrated into the textbooks. It's not integrated into the way we see the nature of America. So I want to go back to something that Diane was saying. In order to understand the country in which we live, in order to be civil, we have to recognize the other. But that other also has to fit into the pattern of our history. Our is a very uh, politicized term. What is ours and what is theirs? And until that history 
doesn't begin to reflect the transformation that that community and the Arab community and the Indian community and other communities until we start having a more enlarged vision of what the United States is all about, we are not going to be able to really connect with the different groups. I want to finally go back to something that Mark was saying. Uh, Mark is saying, if I understand his point, that uh, we are fostering a generation that is ignorant, that doesn't know much about foreign policy and doesn't know much about American uh, domestic policy either. I couldn't agree with him more. But he sounds incredibly pedantic, and so do I, when we simply say this generation doesn't know about what we know and we have to do something about it. This generation doesn't know because it's a generation that is disengaged. It has a new way of perceiving things. And not only do we have to bring them to who we are, we have to go to where they are. The lack of uh, knowledge, the lack of engagement, is something that might already have become a pattern. My own 13-year-old son knows absolutely everything you want to know about baseball, everything you want to know about Adele and the Grammys, about movies, everything you want to know about pop culture today. I can't say he's ignorant, but if I ask him where the, where the Italian Renaissance started, I'm sure that he's not going to know. I adore my son. Hopefully at one point he's going to be able to learn in college that it started in Florence, that there is a whole broad culture over there. But if I keep on looking at him as an ignorant, as a person who doesn't know, the one that is being left out is me. Thank you. Elon Savans, thank you very much. Elon. It's a very important lesson right there. Civility begins with recognizing what and who our country is, acknowledging that, and we're glad that you are here to help us do that right now. Take us to a very simple point then. In that recognition, in that acknowledgement, the noun civility and its equivalent in Spanish, yeah. or the lack thereof. There's no word in Spanish for civility. It's as simple as that. There is a word that comes close to it, that is cortesía, which will be courtesy. Being, being courteous to one another, uh, but I don't know if, if being courteous is to be civil. And the fact that it is absent in one's vocabulary, the fact that our vocabulary in Spanish doesn't present the same terms and the same paradigms is already a beginning to engage us in different ways of perceiving what civility is about. Sit down, join us, we'll dive Thank on you. in. Thank you, Ilan Stoppins. Thank you very much indeed. Can we, can we just stick with that for one moment? And Diana, I'll, I'll come to you, but let, let's stay with this for a second on understandings of civility. Um, so there's no direct translation or no single word. So we have 50 million Latinos in the country. If we're talking about civil discourse, what does that mean to the Latino ear? What is the equivalent? What are the English words in which, if, if we're going to engage in English in which we communicate that? How does it resonate, the whole notion? I think that it, that it is increasingly important, Tom, to recognize that this is a bilingual nation. Mm -hmm. That it is not that Spanish doesn't have that word, but that English has it, and that these are two languages that describe the world in two different ways. That we might hope, as we did with previous immigrations, that everybody's going to come to English. Hopefully, that's going to be the case. It doesn't seem to be right now. And if, if, if it isn't, then it is a matter for us to understand how the Spanish psyche works through the Spanish language. For the way we describe the world is the way we build sentences, is the way we shape our dictionary. How a word is defined in it says so much about the culture. And, and for Latinos to be able to do that, it is important for us, I think, to realize that there, the emergence of a new culture, the Latino culture that is no longer Latin American, but not really yet, American culture is something that would probably be in Spanglish, in the in-between, in code switching, in the fact that as a culture you are mestizo, you're neither here nor there. Spanglish doesn't have a term either. Spanglish is actually a rather rough way of describing the world, the equivalent of, of, of a gangster English in, in, in rap. And I don't think that this means that Latinos are not interested in civility. I think that Latinos so far, and I'm simplifying a 50 million, it's a huge population, is our bubbles living in the country not quite connected with one another and with us. 
And it is not that your failure alone. No, I don't mean their failure. And, and really, I'm not, I'm not pursuing a language question or agenda, but rather a, a social interaction, a, a political construct. If we are to embrace, acknowledge, respect, be civil toward, and this, is a, th this cultural conversation gets us to the real scale of the challenge here, because it's not even you know, some kind of old style Norman Rockwell civil discourse we're describing. It's much more diverse than that today, culturally. Um, you know, you, you give us a bunch of words that might, you know, urbanidad or decoro or uh, affabilidad or attention. Uh, is there waiting in our Latino culture a, a cultural tradition that will respond to the notion of civil discourse that you've heard described here so far today? Is there a common ground waiting to be inhabited? Or is this a matter of civics education? You speak of education and does that education have to be two-way? When you have 50 million people, it may be that we have to adopt some, some you know, other way, uh, notions of civility ourselves. Help us understand that. I, I would say the latter. Um, I think that it is not a matter of um, Americanizing Latinos. It is a matter of recognizing also that the, the country has become Hispanicized and that the country is no longer what it was 20 or 30 years ago. Certainly not in California, in Texas, in New Mexico. It is appalling to many of us to hear the uncivil discourse that is taking place in Arizona, where many books by Latino writers are no longer accepted uh, in the classroom because they are perceived to foster hatred or change. And some of them are literally censored. There is a big discussion among Latino writers of what it means now to be censored in America simply because you are a Latino writer. Um, I think that this is a very decisive moment in American history. Many Latinos voted for Barack Obama not because he was the first, potentially the first black president, but because he was the first potentially non-white president. Hoping that he would become the first everything other president mm -hmm. than simply white. Many of us are incredibly disappointed because he has not lived up to the idea of bringing the country from a black and white paradigm to something that encompasses the plurality of who we are, the plurality of voices, the plurality of languages, the plurality of visions. It is a much more global world. Immigration is going back and forth in a way that it never was. The United States is not a cohesive country the way it was in the 19th century. We have to recognize that. Civility in a context of extreme plurality. Let's stay with this cultural theme, Diana Eck, and to take the Muslim community, not nearly as big as the Latino, but very substantial, growing, um, gaining the kind of pushback that you've described here today. What about the notion of, and again, like the Latino community, a very diverse community in and of itself, the Islamic community, if we can even speak of that in this country. Well, well, what about the notion of civil discourse in that community? It's not being extended to them, civil, civility in the, in the uh, geez, insults that you describe here, but what about the internal sense of civil discourse, what it might mean? Well, and it, whether they're actually talking about civil discourse is another issue, but to me, the real uh, sort of proof of the pudding of civility, of becoming involved in civil society and participation, which is at the very bedrock of democracy, mm -hmm. that that is something that Muslims have been doing in the United States. The development of national political action groups, of the Muslim Public Affairs Council, of the Islamic Society of North America, of a whole range of Muslim groups that are interested in voting and registering people to vote. That's a real signal of believing in the American thing, which is a participatory democratic society. And so there's real evidence of that. And a lot of people who are engaged in the project of participation, running for Congress, being elected to city councils and that sort of thing. We are getting pushback on it. But I think the whole, uh, the whole impetus to redefining the we, uh, we the people of the United States of America, much more complex. But you're describing a population uh of fellow citizens mm -hmm. ready to engage yeah, and the ready kind of to terms engage. being uh, mm -hmm. often mm -hmm. celebrated here mm -hmm. today yeah. and, and um, increasingly rejected from that party. That Well, rejected uh, by some from that. I mean, it's hard to really gauge how many of the, uh, you know, of the people I was describing today are there, except that their media presence is huge. And I think the effect they have 
uh, politically is probably much bigger than their size. But I think the readiness to engage and the fact that, um, you know, in so many ways, our Muslim neighbors, like many of our Latino neighbors and Hindus and Sikhs as well, are fast becoming uh, American and changing the meaning of what American means, really. I mean, that's the other part of it. Um, but you get this sort of pushback. Well, you know, that uh, show that was on this spring, All American Muslim, um, and people got upset about it. Some people, because these Muslims in Dearborn, Michigan, they were too normal. I mean, they were playing on the Fordson football team, and they were doing all sorts of things that we don't think of Muslim Americans doing. Um, so, you know, there's a lot going on in this new multi-religious, multicultural America, and it's scary to many people. Mark. Lilla, here we have a couple of cultures, among the many in this country, and two that are fast-growing, dynamic cultures here, uh, both getting, getting kinds of pushback. I mean, when you think of your definitions of civility, now apply them to an even more, we've been culturally diverse for a long time, but still there's been an explosion, as Elon says, since the 50s. Uh, how, how does your vision of what civil discourse w w would const be constituted of uh, flourish in this kind of environment where we have such a pluralistic culture? Well, well what's interesting is I, I saw Ilan nodding when Diane was talking, but I felt that what Diane said actually refuted what Ilan had said. In what way? In that um, I grew up in Detroit and watching the enormous success story of uh, Muslim Americans on the west side of Detroit bleeding into Dearborn yep. and now everywhere is one of the great American success stories. Is that a world apart? It is not a world apart. These kids grow up, these kids get the, have the same source of civic education in this country that all other kids do. They watch television. It's television today which is creating, helping to create American citizens. That when you show gay characters enough on television, is one, I think a big change in Hollywood has helped bring about this change that Alan Wolf was talking about in the past 10 years. There's a way in which Americans get socialized into American democracy in two places, popular culture and the workplace. If people are integrated at those two levels, eventually they become Americans and the difference is not significant in the way they conceive of political life. I don't see that Latinos, um, have a different way of looking at political life, and certainly not just because they don't have a, a word for civility. I'm reminded of, um, uh, well, I guess a source of my own civic education, of course, is watching South Park every once in a while. And uh, there's an episode where the kids are taken to a shopping mall, and as part of their multicultural education, they're taken to a food court where they have food from all these countries, mm. right? Yes. The camera pans back. And it turns out there are pipes coming down to these kitchens. And up at the top is Chef, the black chef with the white hat, throwing the same slop into each, into each one. It just comes out a different extruder. Yeah, it just comes out. But essentially, my Latino students are Americans, top to bottom. Elon? Um, Mark is wrong. <laughs> and I'll tell you why he's Civilly wrong. speaking. Um, yes, he's right and he's wrong. He's mostly wrong, but I'll start with the right. Um, this is civility, he, ladies and gentlemen. He's right because, because the classroom is the television screen, but the two fastest growing television networks in the United States are in Spanish, Univision, Univision. and Telemundo. Most Latinos in the United States get their news from Univision and then from Telemundo, and if you, got, if, you, if you knew Spanish and turned the television on, you would get a very different sense of what civility and Americanness is than when you turn ABC or CBS. And it's as simple as, uh, the insistence of the main uh, news show on Univision saying how racist this country is, how we are not being included in, the number of undocumented citizens that, that are constantly being rejected. The television is reminding us, or is probably mirroring, mirroring what we feel as a community, that this is not a country that is fully opening its arms to us. Now, the, the, there are many Latinos that watch ABC, CBS, very few Latinos that watch PBS, because PBS is a channel that has, even though being public, has all but given up on Latinos. It seems that it, it, when it includes it, it is on Latino Day or Latino uh, Month, and otherwise it is not a representation of who we are. So if we're going to use the media 
as an expression, certainly the Spanish, there has never been an immigrant group in this country with so much media and so powerful as Latinos. No immigrant group has had two television networks. The political campaigns in 2008 invested more in the Spanish language television networks than in the English networks because they knew that this was the way to get to the Latino population. And if this is who we are, then it often falls outside of the radar of most Americans how we are perceiving ourselves. Let me ask you, uh, civil discourse is often thought of in terms of a political context. So, as this Latino population, one way or another, becomes engaged with politics here to look out for their interests, to look out for their communities, to look out for themselves, how do you think that changes the flavor of American politics? And does it turn it toward what we, maybe too uh, parochially, think of as traditional civil discourse or not? It's, it's really um, too early to say for me. Uh, Latinos have been in this country from the very beginning, but we have not seen the numbers until very recently. Right. Um, there were Latinos during the colonial period, there were Latinos in the 19th century, Latinos fighting the, in the Civil War, certainly Latinos fighting in the First and Second World War, Vietnam, but the explosion... The 50 million, no, that's a 50 million is a, is a monumental number. You are in San Antonio or in Los Angeles, where the population now is mostly Latino. The, the most popular names in L.A. are Maria and Juan or Jose. One out of every two babies in L.A. is of a Latino background. Many of them do not know English. They know Spanish. It is perfectly possible to exist in this country without entering in this type of debates in English, but entering in those debates in another language, in Spanish. The question is, are those debates taking place in those other languages? And my feeling is no. My feeling is we don't have time for those debates. We're working three, four shifts. We are very busy trying to figure out what to do with our kids dropping out from college. It's, it's, a, it's a different reality. At the very top level then, for the majority population, the rest of the population in this country, what would constitute at the top level civility toward this population which you describe as unembraced? I think that I, at the very top level, and it is not a representative mm -hmm. sample, it is the idea that you can become part of this country by entering the discourse of this country. So at that level, the professors that teach at Amherst or that are at UCLA, the idea is you become a, a sellout by entering that discussion with the rest of the country. I, by this I don't mean that the rest of the population will not become American. Mm -hmm. no. I just think that it's very important for us to realize that after 1950, becoming American is something very different. Very different from our comfort zone of what we have been. And it is crucial for us not to describe others that are not part of this debate as ignorant. It is us who are ignorant if we do not acknowledge and enter that debate as well. Diana, do you think... Oh, yes, please. Yeah. Um, you know, I would just like to offer a different cultural perspective from a do another place, and that is what happens with non-European immigrants in Europe. The kind of things that are being said in Telemundo would not be said in Europe. Why? That there's is, no forum for that? There's, there, no there's no forum, and with the immigrant group around which there is the most controversy and tension, that Muslims in Europe are not, in, you know, th that there is an apartness there th that is serious. That, um, and it's, it comes both from the outside and the inside. But there's an apartness uh, here that Elon's describing. No, but, I'm, but let me explain what that mm -hmm. means. I mean, apartness means you don't intermarry. You do not join the army. Uh, when, you are, when you are interviewed, 45% uh, as uh, there was a poll a few years ago in Bedford and around those areas in, in Britain, and the second generation of uh, children of Muslim, Muslim immigrants were actually feeling less attached to Britain than their parents were. Mm. Uh, it was about 35 to 45 percent. And one of the things that feeds part of this separateness uh, in some of these countries, what sees this, especially in the Turkish, well, in the Pakistani and Bangladeshi population in Britain and in the Turkish population in Germany, mm. is that young men uh, are, are less inclined to marry a Muslim woman who's been brought up in Europe 
and in a sense modernized, and they're getting their brides from home. That, so leaning is a, out. that is a life apart. To have a television announcer talk about representation, the need for representation, that's as American as apple, apple pie. And yet, you're hearing from a member of this community a vivid dissatisfaction with embrace, absorption, uh, connection to the civil life of the country. Well, well maybe unlike Ilan, I'm surprised to be in this position. It's not a word I ever use, but I'm not an essentialist. I don't think there's an essence to being Latino here, and that talking to one Latino is to understand what it's like to be a Latino. No, I would, we speak to Alan as a Latino, but also as a, an observer, a closer observer than I, perhaps, than, than you, of this community. We're not essentializing him, we're sure. okay. taking advantage of his observation. No, but the question is whether the kind of apartness that he's implying is, is really there. You know, I, I, I believe, Mark, that that immigrant groups today, particularly those that are in very large numbers, um, do have an apartness. There are populations in Florida, in California, where first, second, third, four generation Latinos have not, have not left the enclave to enter the middle class by moving out into the suburbs and moving out of the immigrant uh, context. I believe that the difference between immigration today and immigration with Jews and with Italians is dramatic. With Latin Americans, the closeness of the place once called home, particularly with Mexicans, is, is, is essential. And for many that come to this country, come here for six months, and then cross the border legally or as, as undocumented, going back and forth in, with, with rather ease, uh, there are many issues that are going on within the Latino community of marrying outside. And it is sometimes seen, depending on the community you're talking about, as being better to marry another, a Puerto Rican, if you're Mexican, than marrying somebody who is white because you're really literally living, living the context altogether. So these are, I, I believe that the dynamic of immigration has changed. Uh, the, the numbers are, I, I, I hate to always go back to numbers, but the numbers are so large that uh, in, a, in a city like San Antonio, where 78% of the population is Latino, the idea of a, a, an eth ethnic self no longer, no longer plays out as black and white, the, the way we in the Northeast look at it. And the idea of belonging is also crucial in a way that hasn't, either hasn't been or present a, presents a new paradigm. Um, it is certainly a global culture. It is very similar to what's happening in Europe too. Um, certainly in France, the issue of Arabs and the Muslim population in particular is one that is, that is creating fractures uh, in the texture of the society, the way the, the Palestinians are in Israel or the way the Mexicans are in the United States. Yes. The writing, per permit yeah, me to sorry, pull this sorry. back to our theme, if I may. And, and Diana, let me put this to you. We have always had uh, diversity in this country, though by no means at the scale that we have it today. And perhaps not in the, the, the color variety that we have it today, uh, with every gradation in, in significant numbers. So I wonder if this new scale of diversity and as you look at the Islamic population in our country or beyond that, does, does it, will it require redefining what we, redefining civil discourse, which for all the debate about it today, it's still, I think, our political ideal, civil discourse. This is our political ideal. Does it, will it require redefining what's the civil discourse we aspire to or embracing civil discourse as we've understood it all the more vigorously? I think it inevitably does redefine it to a great extent because the participants in the civil society and in the political realm of discourse are m m many are much more diverse than ever before. But how do you redefine it and keep it? We're talking about civil discourse in American democracy. American mm -hmm. democracy has particular mm -hmm. roots, and I'm not trying to hope, pick up one sure. of these signs here, but yeah. it has mm -hmm. enlightenment roots, it sure. has particular traditions mm -hmm. that inform it. They're, they're there in the Constitution, they're there in our jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. how, how, do you, how do you graft, I'm sure we've done this already in ways that are beyond my grasp, but how well, do you some graft Some of it is new... very, very symbolic in the mm -hmm. sense that um, there are, you know, in the United States Congress, there are invocations offered by imams in the halls of Congress mm -hmm. or in just about any state house in the United States. Uh, the presence of Sikhs who are a very small minority in some, to some extent, but are very clear about their own civil rights 
and the development of, uh, of uh, Sikh civil rights organizations that are as uh, passionate about the American Constitution as any other civil rights well, th people. These things go mm -hmm. to respect, they go to recognition of mm -hmm. ceremony and, and diverse tradition. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the, 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 the manner of discourse that we think in some ideal mm -hmm. as civil discourse, that is informed, as Mark says, uh, respectful, um, vigorous, because otherwise what's the point? Uh, pushing toward a, a kind of a actionable communal consensus has been pushed back on here today, but at some point you've got to decide what to do as a country. I mean, is there any reason to think that our many strands of culture in this country will not weave into that formula once again, ultimately? Well, I would hope they would. Um, but w the one thing that hasn't been mentioned here is that we have a form of discourse that's very involved in American politics that is basically religiously informed. I'm talking about Christian right, especially, and the way in which Christian dis discourse of this um, extremist variety becomes uh, infused in political life. And uh, of course, Latinos don't disrupt that very much. I mean, they're all Christians. We don't, you know, they don't frighten anyone in that no, no, respect, no, no, except no, the fact that they're. Hmm? Not all, Not all are. I know they're increasing uh, Latino Muslims, etc. And Protestants. And pro Protestants, Catholics, etc. But the fact that, uh, you know, of a Christian nation is disrupted by the fact that um, there are a lot of people here who are not Christian, who are Sikhs and Hindus mm -hmm. and Jains and Muslims and uh, above all uh, Wiccans and others, who actually also uh, feel that they have a claim on our constitution, on our military, on uh, the rights that are affordable to everybody. And that but does, does that change disrupt our fundamental our notion of civil discourse or simply the, the, the trappings, that it, the, you know, the prayer before the discourse? Well, I mean, it, it does affect the fundamental notion of civil discourse when you say, who is the we that is included in this we, the people of the United States of America? And, you know, sometimes when the we includes folks that we are not used to having as our, uh, our fellow belongers, but people who are more seen as strangers, that makes people upset, uh, accusatory, uh, liable to, um, uh, to disparage the but, other. But, but Mark, the, the we in, in the great American tradition, uh, and of course this betrayed time and again in the streets or you know, under the tree of strange fruit, the we was at a very universal ideal within it, even if that wasn't always acted on. Uh, is the civil discourse that we've traditionally thought of as growing out of our political tradition, is it, is it amenable to the cultural diversity that we're facing now? It's, it's been embraced by our cultural diversity before, in the past. Yeah, well, well here maybe, maybe it is good for me to return to the distinction I made between um, uh, social civility and political civility. Because certainly we have, at the social level, we've become a much more diverse nation. There is not this sense anymore of there being a model American. And the latest and numbers just this week on the number of inter-ethnic marriages just huge. absolutely rocketing right, in this country, right. the percentage. On, on the one hand. But is it the case that any ethnic group in America is bringing to the table a different view of political life? That's a question in Europe. That's a real question. It is not a question here. Latinos do not bring a different view of what constitutes legitimate government to the United States. And in that sense, we are united around that idea, and it's an idea that's being questioned in Europe. I have to put Although that to that you, Although that is the precisely the accusation that some of the right-wing groups are making about the Muslims, which is they don't really, it's not just a religion, they really are about the business of trying to subvert American law and our constitution. And, well, uh, like Christianity is, is, is a faith that looks to look beyond just uh, text, uh, scripture, let's say. What, what about, the, you've agreed, disagreed on so many things about the Latino community. What about this notion that there is not a fundamental uh, rupture between the Latino sense of what political life ought to be in this country and the, in the broader sense? There is not a fundamental rupture with, the, with the, the, the political vision of the United States, but there's no embrace either. In other words, we're not posing, I think Mark is right, we're not posing, Latinos are not posing, as in Europe, an alternative political way of looking at things, but are not, and Latinos is only one group, yeah. are not necessarily 
it's feeling part of the of the we conversation and as such there's an apathy there is a sense of disengagement there's a sense of we are not being included into the in, in the debate in the table and while we are not posing an alternative way political or religious we're also not feeling that this is in in what results of that a, a sense of duality are we here can should we go back can we keep this this uh, bridge-like hyphenated nature of being in two sides. But also, as, surely we can see this in a positive way as an opportunity. There, Could, there, sure. There's an openness right there at oh, the sure. same time. Absolutely. We come to the point in our conversation where we open the floor to you here in the hall and around the country. We're eager for your questions by webcam, by Facebook, by email, by Twitter. Uh, for our guests in this hour, Diana Eck, Mark Lilla, and Ilan Stavans. Uh, let me go first, if I may, to, here's an email from Kathleen, again from California and uh, Claremont, one of our sponsors today, I should say, by the way. Oh. Question here, um, does civility mean toleration? And if so, are there limits to toleration? Are there points of view which society should not or even cannot tolerate? And I guess we may hear in this some particular reference to Islam. Diana? Well, I don't know. I mean, tolerate has a lot of different uh, sort of senses here. I mean, how much poison can a person tolerate in their system, et cetera, without... I mean, I, I, I like toleration as a term. I don't know if it's, a, you know, a, a counterpart to civility. It seems to me that we tolerate many things that we know not very much about, and that in a society as vigorously um, argumentative as ours and as diverse as ours, Toleration is just too thin a foundation for our future. It, it's an important thing, but we need a, a level of engagement and a level of knowledge that Mark is talking about that goes beyond a kind of live and let live toleration. Let, let me be very presumptuous with Kathleen. And Kathleen in, in California, pr forgive me if I misinterpret here, but take Islam because some mm -hmm. elements of Islam in the popular understanding, uh, let's say treatment of women, mm -hmm. um, some Americans, some American women may say, that element of that culture, I do not want. It, you know, it won't fit within my understanding of American uh, political life. I cannot tolerate that. Mm -hmm. uh, where does that leave us in terms of civil discourse? Do we, do we run up against that? If we're looking at civil discourse and cultural difference, do we run up against different expectations which discourse can't surmount? Yeah, I, 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 we do in so many ways, I think. And uh, there would be many Muslims who would also say the same thing that Kathleen or uh, our imaginary in, person might say. Mm -hmm. And many people who would say the same thing about not being able to tolerate views of women in certain aspects of Christianity, Judaism, um, and mm -hmm. you know other faiths of the world as well. There are things that we individually as citizens find intolerable, and the things that we communally find intolerable, we usually have some sort of legislation that prohibits, and, uh, and that becomes a, a matter of our, what, of our political and civil life. But the community is diverse, and this goes right yeah. to Mark's mm -hmm. point. You have social yeah. civility, mm -hmm. wherein I, I may, from a distance, tolerate your internal arrangement mm -hmm. in your family. It's not yeah. mine, but it's mm -hmm. yours, fine. But at the poli level at of the political, political level. civility, discourse, that's where we engage. That's where we hash it out. Mm -hmm. What happens to those those sharp differences in expectation or more mm -hmm. uh, when we get when, when we find we run up against a hard wall uh, well it, i mean this is the issue discourse. is that many of those things for example in some of these uh, demonstrations there uh, women in uh, you know in shorts in california carrying mm -hmm. signs saying uh, how terrible islam is for women now um, you know that is the use of a particular form of accusation that has something vaguely to do with Islam, but, uh, but only slightly, and that is used in a political context to say something much more, Just which is other. that we need to other Islam in a major way. Let's get another here. This is from Salam Mir. Question for Mark Lilla. And it goes like this, is by email. What should the role of the humanities and education at large be in the teaching of civility? You're talking about teaching our uh, new generations, teaching civility to students with the weakening interest in the humanities, is there a role the discipline can play in the education of future generations of <clears throat> scientists, engineers, IT techs, etc.? cetera? Mm. No, that's a good question. Um, well, I, I, I teach in the Great Books program at, uh, at Columbia, 
sort of take freshman students from Homer to Virginia Woolf in a speeding car over a year. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, Is that civil? And uh, I guess one of the things, that, and we're talking about the humanities, I'm not even talking about social sciences, the humanities, is that after reading some of these ancient texts, and even then European texts from an earlier era, both the strangeness, the uniqueness, and the fragility of the kind of political life we live, historically considered, is extraordinary. This is an accident. It just happened. It's not natural for people to engage in the way we do politically. What do you mean and, by that, if, if you don't mind? I mean by that that people tossed into a room, you know, at any point in history are not suddenly going to be, you know, everyone bringing in cookies and, and having coffee together and having a conversation. And what that brings one's attention to are the preconditions for their social, cultural, intellectual preconditions for having a democratic polity that works. Certain assumptions about what it is to be a human being, what authority is, what constitutes just and unjust authority, and so on. And so you can get an extraordinary political education by reading everything from, uh, from Boccaccio through uh, Lear through, um, you know, right through But Virginia if it's that Warren. fragile, this says we need to pour effort into the kind of education that our, that our questioner asks about. I mean, if it's that fragile, if it's that strange, if it's that's outside of sort of the norm of history, uh, my goodness, we better get up on, uh, on our game. Which is why I need a raise. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the raise. <laughs> Um, and, and, and uh, well, I mean, I, I guess it goes without saying that you've got to extend it beyond the humanities, but if, if those, if that wing of the academic airplane is shrinking, maybe, maybe some of this has to be brought into the, the uh, sort of a harder science side of education as well. Here's a question from uh, the University of Arizona. This is from Casey for Elon Stavans. And Casey writes, you bring up an important point that engaging youth is a critical step for our country to reach a point of civility. How do we meet younger and increasingly diverse generations and engage them in being interested in embracing their diversity with increased civility and civil discourse? Well, you don't do it, Casey, the way it is being done in Arizona, your state. <laughs> no offense. Um, unfortunately, oh, the way to do it is to bring not only students to the classroom, but uh, the students' culture to the classroom as well. And I couldn't agree with Mark more. Um, it is crucial that we, that we use the humanities, uh, understood in a very broad sense, to teach ourselves and others what uh, this very fragile concept of democracy has been. But the humanities themselves are always a, a moving target. Uh, the books that we teach change and the concept of, of democracy and the concept of, of a we-ness changes as well. And I think that in order for the classroom to remain current and to remain valid, it has to keep up with what society is doing. It can't be one, two, three steps behind. We often in academia simply hear what society is doing and then kind of cross our arms and wait 10 years to start producing something on this matter. There are a lot of Latinos and Muslim and, and, and other books that could be already part of that humanities discussion, not only to broaden the perspective of a Latino or a, a Muslim student, but to broaden the perspective of just about everybody, including the teacher. Civility and culture, now we're really playing three-dimensional chess. Let's bring the conversation home to the hall here. Yes, please. Hi. I think a real measure of civilization and civility and morality is how well we treat our children. And I haven't heard a whole lot of discussion about that. I've heard about um, civil rights through Martin Luther King, through Cesar Chavez. There was a question posed about how uh, we treat our gay people within our uh, midst. Yes. But as to children, I'm wondering, they have, there's a much higher poverty rate than there used to be amongst children, especially here in our American society. Education, when you compare it to education in European countries and other developed nations, is much worse. Health care is much worse for children here than in other developed societies. I'm wondering if the reason for this is because 
the cultures that are now making up a much larger proportion of our civilization here in the U.S., our population, are non-Caucasian, and they're much younger. And so the younger people within our midst, <coughs> we're, being, we're ignoring their needs because of cultural reasons rather than what we should be doing as a civil and moral society. Let us pick it up. Are, are, are we checking out on our youth from, from, the, from, from the young up because it is diverse? No, I don't think we are, Tom and uh, our colleague here. Um, the dropout rate among Latinos is enormous. Uh, in other words, we can't keep Latinos in the classroom. This might be because of a variety of reasons. Uh, but it, but uh, teenage pregnancy is one of them. And as a result, what didn't happen in the classroom will happen in the home in a way that, hope, that society didn't hope exactly to happen. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very worried that uh, Latinos are reaching 15%, uh, close to 20% of the population in this country, and that is not the percentage of students of Latino background. And if we are not doing something in the classroom, we will eventually not be able to do it in other places. Pop culture does not do it. When Barack Obama wanted to choose a Supreme Court justice that was of Latino background, he didn't have that many options. And my fear is that, that those options are not increasing, that in fact are decreasing. We are not producing the amount of potential candidates that eventually can be at the very top to help us change things at the bottom. Um, and, uh, and if we don't do something about that, it is the children, you're saying, that hooked to the television as they are, will not be able to process this uh, uh, conceptual view of civility that we're all hoping they will do. I mean, this is another reminder not to be so caught up in a conversation about civil discourse that we are in uncivilly ignoring a whole cluster or sector of our population. Yes. Which was sort of my question. Uh, it would be good to have some youth experts that we could talk to about, but I'll have to ask you since most of you are kind of my age, but I do talk to my kids. And I see, I know that uh, conservatives of all stripes often try to keep their kids away from popular culture for fear it will corrupt. The role of the popular culture consumed by our teens and 20-somethings, positive or negative in terms of fostering pluralism and uh, civil discourse? Mark what are Lilla, your thoughts? let me come first to you, Mark. Oh, I, I think on that score, it's probably the only thing you can say in favor of our popular culture right now. Why? Um, is that it, um, it displays an ideal world. There's an utter lack of realism about, uh, about American television. You know, it, this is no longer true, but back in the day, at a certain point, I thought, gosh, it seems like there are more black judges on American television than in American courts. <laughs> um, and the way in which countercasting and representative casting, the way um, gay characters are showing up in, in popular culture now, as just people, not, there's nothing, it's not the theme of them being gay, they just happen to be gay. There's a normalization there. That's a great thing. What the popular culture does not do, it, well, it leaves the impression that if we just learn to get along, political life will be okay. But that's at the social level. Politics is something else, and the popular culture today disengages our children politically. Diana, do you see a popular culture message about the way we engage politically with one another, about that discourse, that civil discourse, ideally? Well, I, I would say simply from the standpoint of living, as I do as a Harvard housemaster with 450 undergraduates, um, I have over the last 10 years seen a lot of student life up close, mm -hmm. a very diverse population. Um, in which many of the things that uh, people my age and older worry about in terms of difference, uh, religious, cultural uh, difference in our society, uh, are taken for granted. I mean, there is a level of engagement with one another on the issues of the world that somehow doesn't pay too much attention on whether we're Hindus or Muslims or uh, Orthodox Jews, Christians, atheists, or Otherwise, we have quite a number of Latino students, including undocumented students in our community. Um, the relation of students 
one to another, I think is so much more energetic and close than the relation of their parents to one another wherever they came from, that it gives me a real sense of hope about the future. You see this openness in this generation. I see it in my own uh, home and family. Uh, I wonder, Ilan, if that in itself may be, you know, maybe we will simply leave some of our prejudices and barriers behind in time as we, as we step forward in generations. Maybe some of the, the obstacles to civil discourse simply recede because they're no longer such felt issues by the up and coming generations. I, I wish that the, the population of the United States was like the population of Diane's students at Harvard or, that, no. or my population of, of Amherst students who are terrific and I adore and, and uh, I feel very privileged and proud to have. But, uh, but that is a, a very small elite of the country and uh, spend some time at the borough of Manhattan Community College spend some time at Dade County Community College, and that is the experience. Now, it might but, be very is similar. It, is the tolerance not there? Is the openness not there? Oh, I think that at the level of colleges, community colleges in particular, the eagerness to find out who we are, mm -hmm. who is the other, the curiosity is absolutely there. It's different from what it was in previous generations, but so, are every, <coughs> so is every generation. Um, I, I, it's just not as prepared, obviously, through having been trained in private schools or charter schools, etc. And it doesn't have the sophistication um, that one, one wished it had, but that is the reality. And I think, uh, if I can go back to the question of, the, of our colleague, I don't think it's a matter of if is popular culture good or bad. Popular culture is. What are we going to do what, with popular culture is the question. Not, I mean, we can all uh, cry and say the, the amount of people killed in the latest uh, Denzel Washington movie is astronomical, far greater than in the neighborhood where the movie was filmed. But that is what the kids are going to see, and the question is, that movie is reaching far more, far more people than the artist or any other of the more sophisticated movies, and it has an impact. And that is the population that, that, that every country has the pop culture it deserves. Well, uh, we hear pop culture here <laughs> described in both positive and negative terms, and some quite positive as well. Yes, please. Uh, yes, um, you have, uh, I think, emphasized to a certain extent the changes that have happened in our society. And I'm surprised by the extent you seem to think that what we're facing now is new. And everything you've talked about today reminds me very much of Boston during the 19th century, that uh, groups that came in in large number clustered together and retained their language and their culture intact and didn't mix or intermarry for generations. Uh, even in a place like uh, the upper Midwest, the German communities were still speaking German at home three or four generations after they arrived. And the Irish, when they came, were not exactly welcomed by the people of uh, Beacon Hill. You know, they made great ser er, servants. The girls all went and became servants. And the men provided a great source of labor so that they could build mills and, and factories. But they burned down their churches. One in Dorchester was uh, burned while it was being built, St. Gregory's Church. Uh, the convent in uh, Charlestown was burned down. A church in Bath, Maine was burned by rioting mobs. So I just don't, I think, I don't say it's a good thing, but I just say it's not an, a new thing. There's a kind of continuing tribalism and learning and looking at this through the past and not treating it as new might be helpful to us. Thank you very much. Uh, what, do, what do you think, Diana, first you, well, relax, I mean, I this is yes, America. A, absolutely. We, we burn down uh, churches. You mean, <laughs> you're quite right. <laughs> I mean, we have so much to learn when we Moss. go back to... You know, all of the, you know, from the Chinese exclusion and, the, you know, things that, I mean, we, ha we have a long history of, um, of antipathy to the other and host hostility, uh, even as the we became gradually broader. I, one of the things that is different today, though, I, is I think the sort of back and forth between, I mean, we have more, many more bicultural people who do go back and forth, as many Latinos do, who go back and forth, as Gujaratis do, between America and, and India. And these same media who have help this, keep that alive, that, yeah, that who, connection. And we're not sure what it means to be a country in which our citizens are equally loyal to some other place. Um, you, you know, we're not, we're not as certain about what that means. 
even though we continually have much more uh, complex identities individually. We, we take your point about the history, but still we have the scale that Elon describes yep. uh, and the persistence of, a, of a, a kind of absence of the melting dynamic that we once presumed. Yes, sir. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Jeff Stone. This is a great panel. Thank you. Uh, Professor Lilly, you uh, mentioned uh, TV in the classroom as being ways to integrate people together. And I'd like to bring up another way that I don't think has been suggested, and that is proactive face-to-face uh, -face facilitated dialogue amongst people of different racial and ethnic groups. Um, Professor Eck, I think you uh, have done a lot of work in that regard, uh, interreligious, interethnic. Uh, pundits and academics often talk about race, but, and they often call for uh, greater dialogue, but few people actually engage, sit down, engage face-to-face -face in mixed groups uh, and talk seriously about race. Professor Robert Putnam, a few years ago, came out with some research that showed when communities become more ethnically diverse, they become less socially cohesive. That was seized upon, unfortunately, by people like David Duke as a great argument against immigration. However, he, what they left out was that Putman, Putnam said that intentional efforts to bring people together for such things as dialogue are very effective, and he recommended such efforts. Uh, Attorney General Holder, uh, in his uh, Black History Month address a few years ago, famously or infamously said that we are basically cowards in talking about race and race relations are basically the, the same way they were about 50 years ago, outside of work. Um, and then we had the White House Bear Summit after the Gates-Crowley affair, and I was hoping to see cities and towns across the nation start some more proactive uh, dialogue efforts. So I'd like to ask anybody on the panel uh, what you think about intentional efforts, and I'm talking about adults as well as children, to come together for uh, uh, explicit dialogues, well facilitated across racial and ethnic and religious groups to build community, reduce stereotypes, build, build America. Thank you. Uh, don't know what to say against it, but... Well, no, no, no. I mean, you know, we're talking about a, like a small bore effort, and yes. I'm not sure one can generalize it, but I'm struck by your quite the, the spirit behind your question, I think, is absolutely right. Um, I grew up in a very racist neighborhood of Detroit, and my parents were very pro-civil rights. And it was because my father, and, and they you know, might have turned out differently, but my father uh, served in the Air Force in the Korean War and had black fellow soldiers. My mother was trained as a nurse, and she was at a nursing, Catholic nursing school where a lot of the students were black. She served with them. She saved people's lives together with black colleagues. It was part of the tissue of life. But when you have a segregated society, and increasingly segregated, not just racially, but economically, the possibility of there being um, uh, just chance encounters or long-term encounters with people declined. And, and, and that's a huge problem. Build the bridges, Ilan. Sure. I wonder if we are as uh, a socially segregated uh, a nation in, as we are on the internet. I, it seems to me that, it strikes me that your question would also be a question that I would ask. How can we get together in, in face to face, face? But my 13 year old son would say, I'd rather use Facebook. And, and I wonder if this idea of connecting with different groups, in spite of the vitriol that happens on the internet, is actually something that is a, a occurring at a deeper sense among the young when you erase borders of who we are face to face with one another and where a Latino and uh, a African American and, and a person from Ireland would immediately connect and become friends, whatever that word means today, in, in, a, in a way that often doesn't happen in, 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 on a day-to-day -day basis in a church or in a public library or in the classroom. I think that things are happening to this generation on the internet that we, 50-year-olds and, and olders, uh, are, cannot even realize. Can I say just a word yes. about this too? Because the Pluralism Project over the last few years has had this hunch that there was a lot more going on in cities and towns. Uh, inter culturally interfaith wise than anyone had begun to understand. That especially in the last 10 years, this has just mushroomed. 
And so we took out this project on 20 cities to do a mapping of what kind of dialogue, interfaith, intercultural efforts are happening at the urban level in 20 cities across the US. We're just about to uh, sort of release the results of that in our own website on pluralism.org. But it was remarkable. I mean, this is something that people are hungry for. And it, some of it has a, uh, a virtual form on the internet and whatnot, but some of it is really about face-to-face -face meeting people whom we don't often make time to meet if we just leave it to chance encounters in the workplace. And in this session, we see the importance of that. I'm sorry for those of you here and uh, outside that we can't get to, but we're out of time at that point. We see this question of civil discourse and culture, uh, the challenge even broader, not only to bring together a political discourse uh, worthy and up to the challenges of this country, but to do it across cultures in a way that's meaningful and respectful of all. Diana Eck of Harvard, Mark Lilla of Columbia, and Elon Stobbins of Amherst College, thank you very much to thank all you. three. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Civility and American Democracy, a national forum, has been brought to you by UMass Boston in partnership with Mass Humanities, 90.9 WBUR, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the University of Alaska, the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M University, Claremont Graduate University, the Evans School of Public Policy at the University of Washington, the Goldfarb Center for Public Affairs and Civic Engagement at Colby College, the National Institute for Civil Discourse at the University of Arizona, the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anselm College, the Robert F. Wagner School of Public Service at New York University, and the School of Public Affairs at Arizona State University.